So we come to the fourth Sunday of Lent, and um, um, I would say that if, if I were to give a title here, I would say The Enduring Love of the Father. There is just this uh, amazing and enduring love of God for us, despite our, our repeated stubbornness and infidelities and so on. And uh, so we see that in the reading today, there's kind of a balance between God's enduring love, but also our repeated sinfulness. But there is a warning. It, it is that God is rich in mercy and he's very patient. But at some point, there are going to be consequences of sin that just come home to roost. Uh, there's an old saying, you know, sow the wind and you reap the whirlwind. And uh, so God's love and mercy are there for us and they're accessed through repentance. But at some point, we have to also accept that um, uh, although God will be patient with us, and he's very patient and loving, uh, he'll do everything he can to bring us to conversion. But uh, we tend to be stubborn, and we tend to create a lot of trouble for ourselves. So both these things are true in the reading, God's love for us and our stubbornness and how this all works out. And if we're going to hear God's call to repent or not, it's a great drama of your life and of my life and of uh, the lives of uh, everyone you know and love, see? It's a great drama. And uh, we, we tend to sort of look aside, but it is dramatic. We're in the valley of decision. Will you and I, will the people we know and love, our children and grandchildren, family, parishioners, will our, our, fellow, our fellow people from our nation and so on, will they hear the voice and repent of God? Or will they continue on in their stubborn ways and reap the whirlwind? All right. Well, let's take a look at these readings. We're going to kind of survey all the readings. The first reading is from the second book of Chronicles. It's a historical book. It's describing what was going on in the period of the kings um, and um, the kingship in Israel. And um, so uh, there's a kind of a summary statement that begins here at the very beginning of the first reading. Uh, let's call it problems. <laughs> problems. Um, that is to say, in those days, the princes of Judah and the priests and all the people added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abomination of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple. Well, you see, uh, things have not changed, my friends. You know, we have in our time, you know, uh, we have, well, the princes, let's say the secular leaders, um, uh, many of whom are Catholic, but don't follow the church's teachings. You see, we're... We're in a kind of a world now where our, our, our secular government is somewhat at odds with the teachings of the scriptures. And, and uh, the, it wasn't always so. It certainly wasn't perfect. Nobody lived it perfectly, but there was much more of a, uh, you know, kind of being on the same page that is gone now. And, um, you know, the, we also see, though, much more troubling than that is the trouble inside the church. It says, not just the princes, but the priests. And they added infidelity to infidelity. And it says they were practicing abomination to the nation. You know, this is so true today as well. There's so much corruption inside the church. So many people who are not following the teachings of the Lord, up to the highest levels in the church, who say that, well, you know, we need to imitate the world more, and the scriptures are, well... That's nice, but we, we need to sort of ingratiate ourselves with the world. I'm sorry, that is not the job of the church. Jesus never said that. He never said, go out and ingratiate yourself. He said, go out and teach. And, uh, you know, he promised we'd probably get killed for it. We would certainly suffer persecution. And, uh, and yet somehow people sort of flip this and they think we're supposed to be popular and well liked. And they, they, they're sort of, uh, it's, this is everything from mis either misguided the best scenario that they're misguided, the worst scenario is that they're enamored of the world. You know, the job of the church is not to imitate the world or repair it the world. Uh, the, the job of the church isn't even to re reflect the views of its members, because a lot of Catholics are out of sync with Catholic teaching and biblical teaching. No, the job of the church is to reflect the views of its head and founder, Jesus Christ. Okay? And he got killed for what he taught. So enough, uh, I, I, I could go on, but the point is that we see that there are problems here. I would, I would summarize them by saying, you know, the repeated infidelity, worldliness, impurity, by, which is usually meant sexual impurity, you know, and 
there's a kind of a weakness and uh, in our world is hypersexualized, sexually depraved, and an awful lot of folks are saying we need to sort of water down our teachings and kind of get with the program and understand that people are going to struggle. And Well, yeah, that's why we have confessionals, but not change our teachings. Okay. But we start to see, you know, uh, now look, if we were to look at human history, we see this pattern is persistent. Are there good chapters and better periods than others? Yeah, yeah. And uh, some, sometimes we get certain things right and other things we neglect and uh, these things will vary, but at the end of the day, any honest look at human history is going to reveal that there's something very deeply flawed about human nature. We live in a fallen world governed by a fallen angel, and we have fallen natures, and and uh, this is our condition. And so this is what God's dealing with, problems. You got problems. We got problems. <laughs> uh, all right, now God doesn't give up, but we need to be sober, and the God is dealing with problems, namely us and our tendency to have them and not repent. So God's first solution is uh, when, with, the, with all of this infidelity, all of this uh, neglecting his teachings and so on, uh, is to send prophets. So we go from problems to prophets. And it says early and often, early and often, did the Lord send uh, his messengers to them. For he had compassion on them, see, and, and his dwelling place, see. So he sent people, teachers, to remind, to teach, to re-up the, the offer. <laughs> Repent, said the prophets. Come back to the Lord with all your heart, with prayer and fasting. Call upon him while the time is still at hand. You know, oh, early and often, early and often did the Lord send these prophets because it says he has compassion on us, see? Now, ideally, you know, you think of a parent for a minute. You know, if, 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 if a parent has a kid who's kind of getting out of line, they tried to teach their children right from wrong, but they're, they're kind of goofing off and getting out of line. The first thing a, a parent will do is to try to send, you know, to remind them of the teachings, to get into the manner of a prophet and say, now, come on, you know better than that, right? And so we see that uh, the first step, ideally, for a compassionate parent is to try to reason with their kids. Uh, well, it's the same with God and working with us. Uh, he'll, you know, well, you got out of line once, that's it, I'm going to crush you like a bug. No. I'll send you prophets, teachers, others who will remind you, will call you. They'll remind you of what I've said. They'll remind you and summon you back. They'll, they'll put forth my word for the times and, and show you what the reply, your response to the, uh, the signs of the times should be, and, and so on. So again, um, this is, again, a great sign of God's love and mercy for us, you see. So there's problems, all right. Then God sends prophets, right? Now, there does come a time... Um, however, when there are punishments that finally have to come. It says here, it goes on, it says, of these prophets, it says, what was our reply? But they mocked the messengers of God. They despised his warning, scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Okay. Now, you'll notice here that... <clears throat> It, you know, God is going to have to move to another stage here of punishments, but we'll get to that in a moment. But this is why, because you see, although there are problems and God lovingly sends prophets, it says that we scoff at them, mock at them, and so on. You know, it's kind of like in our time, we have this thing called cancel culture or a wokeness or political correctness, these different things where when somebody tries to uphold uh, the biblical teaching, they're, they're often shut down, uh, marginalized, uh, persecuted, sometimes even fined or arrested, uh, called to court, and uh, not just in this country, but other parts of the world. And it, it, it becomes, you see, that this, this is that persecution that prophecy will bring. Okay. Uh, now, again, this is, as I say, true, sadly, even inside the church. And so we see Again, how many uh, priests or bishops or others who do try to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, we got to get back to what the Bible says, um, are sometimes canceled, even by church officials and things. And so uh, this is unfortunately par for the course. Um, it's been historically a problem. It's not new, um, whether in the world of politics or in the church, but it's still deeply lamentable. And so some of the prophets, again, are despised, scoffed at, um, are rejected, mocked, and so on. 
And uh, this is so God notices the problems and in his love sends prophets, but the prophets are pushed off to the margins. And so this does lead then to the next stage we'll call punishments. It says, God then permitted that their enemies would burn the house of God. They tore down the walls of Jerusalem. They set its palaces ablaze. They destroyed its precious, the precious objects. They, those who did escape the sword um, were let off into captive as, as, uh, in, into Babylon, into exile. You see where they became servants, slaves of the, of the king of Ch the, uh, the Chaldeans, namely the Babylonians. Hmm? Wow, you see. <laughs> See, if we're not strong, our enemies easily overpower us. And so the punishment for sin is sin. The punishment, it brings weakness and, and darkness. Sin makes you stupid. And so a lot of these things, you know, bring, you know, ruin upon a culture or upon a, uh, a church or whatever where these things are, are just going on. And we tend to get very, very weak. And our opponents, starting with the demons, but also other worldly opponents, get stronger. And so this is, uh, again, what we see. So God permits this very punishing blow uh, to Israel. Um, it's, it's quite severe. You know, Jerusalem is burned, destroyed, the main city. It's, it's in ruins. The temple, the temple of God is in ruins. You see, wow. And, 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 and so we have this punishment that is rather uh, severe. But what is the purpose of punishment? You know, it's, it is an act of love. It is not to be just, oh, God's venting his anger and he's in a bad, foul mood. But like ideally, a parent, it's like a good parent who punishes a child. They've tried to reason with the kid, but the kid says, I ain't going to do it, old man. All right. So a good, loving father or mother will say, now look, I'm going to have to have some punishments. You're going to be, have your phone is restricted or you're going to be, you know, on a some type of restriction and so on. Now, what is the purpose of punishment? Is it just to say, oh, I'm going to get back at you? And No. The idea of punishment is to help a kid or someone experience in a small way the bad consequences of bad behavior so they don't experience it in a big way. I remember my father would sometimes say, Son, you know, it, 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 you're going to answer to me about this. And, it, you know, if you don't answer to me, you're eventually going to answer to your boss or to the police, or someone, and I tell you right now, it's going to go very bad for you if you have this bad attitude and this defiance that you're showing me. Uh, you say that to your boss, you're fired, see? And you not only are fired, you have a bad reputation. You're going to have a hard time getting another job. Or if you talk back to the police like that, you're going to be, you're going to be taken into custody. They're going to tolerate that, you see? So you better understand that you're going to learn here in small ways or you're going to learn in bigger ways. It's going to hurt a lot more. Well, you see, this is how it is with God the Father. He's saying, look, you know, I, I need you to, you, you to suffer worldly losses so that you don't suffer eternal losses. Yeah, I don't want you to go to hell. Do you understand how awful that is? It's better for me to let you suffer some worldly losses, and maybe you'll come to your senses. Um, or... You know, you you know, as I say, you 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 sadly, you know, you know, you will suffer these eternal consequences. So accept these blows as something now necessary because you're stubbornly refusing to listen to my teachings, my prophets. Now it's time to up the ante a little. Why? Because I love you. The enduring love of God the Father. All right. So we've gone from problems to prophets to punishments. All right. Now again. All of this is, uh, there's an additional purpose, if you will, to this. We go, the um, um, uh, Chronicles here, Second Chronicles we're reading from, says all of this, namely the destruction, the exile in Babylon and so on, was to fulfill the words spoken by Jeremiah, that until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths, during the time that it lies waste, it shall rest while 70 years are fulfilled. So, he focuses on lost Sabbaths. Basically, again, look, I ain't got to go to church on Sunday. Who cares about worshiping God? I don't got to, you know, I'm going to, this is another, it's just another chance to make money and go out and do what I want to do on Sunday, and uh, that's it, you know. And uh, so there's, there's, there's trouble that comes from that when we don't spend time listening to God, worshiping Him and praising Him, and we get off target very quickly. And um, so, again, this causes harm. Uh, sin sets evil loose. Uh, this is just one example of following the Sabbath law. 
but there are other so many other things you know that we, we we've seen you know all the explosion of I don't know everything from sexually transmitted diseases to abortion to uh, you know broken lives and marriages and what, what, what is this it's all from sexual promiscuity and irresponsibility see so it, it could be not keeping the Sabbath it could be other things but the point is that the punishment for sin is sin Sin sets evil loose, and the damage has to be repaired. You can see God says, look, I hear your, your cries for mercy. I forgive you, but now i got to go to work and help to repair and restore all this mess you've made in your own life, but also in the lives of others. It's time to rebuild now. And so the purpose then of the, we have the problems, of course, we have the prophets, then we have the, we have the, uh, the, the punishments, and the purpose is to now, the, the next purpose is to make reparation, to repair for the damages that we've done in our own life and in the lives of others. I mean, just take a simple example of a person who's irresponsible with drink, and they start to get addicted to the stuff or some other drug. Next thing you know, they're addicted to the thing, and they, 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 you know, if they finally do come to a point where i got to stop, most people got a lot of rebuilding to do getting over that getting over the fixation on it some people have physical you know uh reliance on these things and they've got to break that and sometimes they've lost jobs god knows what wrecks they've made of their life or the same with sexual irresponsibility lots and lots of troubles broken families um, the violence of abortion the the loss the hurt the pain of so so many things you see a lot of rebuilding to do when we finally do come to our senses. So we start, we, we keep moving through this, these readings. There's a lot to cover, but the point is that God is not without purpose. He's trying to work with us through his enduring love. And when he notes that there are problems, he sends prophets. And if that doesn't work, he sends some punishments. To, but finally, sometimes he has to let, let, the, let the tough stuff happen and then go to work and repair the damage. That's not easy. You know, we tend to just want God with the wave of the hand to say, well, I forgive you, now let's make everything back to the way it is, you know. I mean, take someone who through irresponsibility, whether reckless driving or drunk driving, has an accident and they kill somebody. And they come to their senses, say, i got to stop drinking or i got to get hold of my anger. Or my And good, but I'm sorry to say that's not going to bring the dead person back to life or make the accident unhappen. Even after there's forgiveness, there's still... A lot of ruin to repair. And so, again, let's try to limit the amount of repairing that God has to do. That's part of purgatory, too. That when we, when we die, we go to purgatory, which isn't just so much, you're going to get punished for your sins. It, 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 it's, a, it, it's about repairing the damage. And our sins cause a lot of damage to our psyche. You know, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, even physically, there's a lot of effects of sin. And um, it's got to be repaired. And part of purgatory is repairing the damage. So you see, this is part of God's enduring love. Not just waving his hand and saying, oh, don't worry, I love you. It's not, we're not dealing with, you know, Barney here, the dinosaur, the purple dinosaur. This is God. The Father and Jesus, who is Lord, and the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? I mean, they are to be taken seriously. They're not playing games with us or just making us making up rules for us. They're, they love us and they want us to be who they've created us to be, and not go to hell. But you see, we have to work with them and realize that if we stubbornly persist, we're going to have a lot of bad experiences. And even when we finally do come to our senses, there's still going to be damage that has to be repaired. Well, that brings us to the gospel, the famous gospel, John 3, 16, God so loved the world. It's always so selectively and partially quoted, you know, we only see the first half and everyone ignores the second half. So let's look at it. It first of all does begin with this persevering love of God. His love for us is enduring, is persevering. He doesn't easily give up, and he'll never stop loving us. He even loves the souls in hell. They've rejected him, and their hearts have turned permanently against him, but he still loves them. But he's not going to force them to live in his kingdom. So you see, there is an enduring love here of God. But you see here, 
So we see that described here, I should say. God so loved the world that he gave us his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn it, but that the world might have life, or be saved, I should say, through him. Wow, so you see, God wants to save us. God wants us to have life. He doesn't want us to perish. And so much does he love us that after all this stuff of sending prophets and trying to repair the damage and all the things that God did in the Old Testament period, he finally said, listen, I'm going to up the ante now, and I'm going to send my son. And he's going to come, and he's going to open up the gates of heaven for those who will follow. And so that's how much I love the world, that I send my own son and I, I, to show you that I love you and I, I, I want you to come and be saved, not, 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 go to, not go to hell. Okay, so this is this beautiful, beautiful picture of God's enduring love for us. And I, I could spend a long time working, but I've already gone on this text, but I could, I, I've got to keep moving to the last point, all right? Uh, I should say the last two points. There is this promotion. Not only does God so love us that he, you know, wants to save us, uh, bring us, uh, and put us back in the Garden of Eden, it's better than that. See, it says God, it says here in, in the epistle of St. Paul, he says, God who is rich in mercy, because of the great love he had for us, um, has, has saved us and raised us up with his son Jesus. So you see, we're not just restored to some garden paradise. God opened up the gates of heaven through his son. You see how good God is? He perseveres. He even offers us, if you will, promotion. Come up higher, you know, <laughs> maximum promotion. But that does lead us to the last point, and it's the second half of this gospel that everyone loves to quote John 3.16, but they don't want to read on. But it, you do read on. He says, now look. It says here, whoever believes in the Lord, see, God wants to save us, so he sends his son, and whoever believes in him will not be lost, but will be saved and have eternal life. All right. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but <clears throat> whoever does not believe is already condemned because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And here's the verdict, that the light has come into the world, but many prefer the darkness. Wow. You know, there's that stubbornness again. I know better than God. I don't want to do that. I don't tell me there's anything wrong with this. How come I can't do it? Everybody else does it. You know, it's not so bad. You know, do the saints talk their way? Of course not. If God wants it, I want it. If God doesn't want it, I don't want it. Well, that's not how a lot of us talk. All hangdog about commandments and being told what to do. And, you know, again, wow, you see. So the Lord is saying, look, I have an enduring love for you. But I want you to know, in this greatness of my enduring love for you, that there's a problem. You tend to, you tend to be stubbornly persistent in your sins, not, not just you personally, but we collectively, right? You're, you tend to be stubborn. There's a problem here, all right? And, and so that I'm going to send you prophets, and I, I'm even going to send you certain punishments to bring you into line. Uh, at the end of the day, we've, got to, we've also got to, uh, you know, we've got to work on fixing the problem and... Um, the purpose is so that we can make reparation for some of the terrible things that have happened to you and that you've done to other people. A lot of work to repair. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'll even up the ante. I'll send my son. And he's going to love you and not just open up the gates of paradise, I mean the gates of, you know, earthly paradise, but the heavenly one. All right, now, are you clear I love you? I, I, I want you to be saved, and I want everything good for you. Are you clear about that, says the Lord? But listen, I'm telling you right now, one last time, you do have a decision to make. Do you want this or not? Well, everybody wants to go to heaven. Don't you? And I see, not everybody, even if everybody wants to go to heaven, not everybody wants to do what it takes to get to heaven, like walk the narrow way, take up a cross and follow, obey, you know, give up some of your favorite sins. <laughs> everybody wants heaven on their terms, but nobody really wants heaven, the real heaven that God is actually offering. And so you see what happens to us is that the danger is that we prefer the darkness. There's something deeply wrong with us, see? And we've got to run to the Father and realize, hey, let it get through my thick skull. He actually loves me. He wants to save me. 
He's good to me. He's not playing games with me, but he's being clear with me. He's saying, look, I will work and work with you and show you such love and mercy and patience, send you teachers, punish you where I need to, just whatever it takes to get you in line so that you don't lose your soul. I'll do it. But at the end of the day, I'll send you my son. And that's the final call. You know, you either follow him or you don't. And the sad truth is that some seem to prefer the darkness. So I'll just finish with the words of an old, um, it's a good Lenten theme, isn't it? I mean, I'm, I love you, I'm offering this to you, but I'm telling you right now, you tend to be stubborn and sluggish. Don't do that. <laughs> and so this old theme of, comes through beautifully in the old song. It just says, sinner. Sinner, you know, it goes on to say, don't let this harvest pass and die and lose your soul at last. So we're in a moment of decision in this thing we call life. You see, will I finally let it get through my thick skull that the Father really loves me and wants to save me? And will I start to cooperate with him and listen to his son whom he sent? Or will I still stubbornly persist and prefer the darkness and miss the last call? So I, I, I like, I would love for these readings to just be all peaches and cream and everything is lovely all the time. There's always going to be a happy ending. But sometimes there isn't, because, but it's not because of God. It is not because of God. It's because of us. And this foolish, stupid, weird thing that we seem to prefer the darkness. Well, ask the Lord, Lord, I, I, I don't trust myself. Just bring me to a, a great love for you, a conversion. Take my desires and turn them back to where they should be toward you. Help me, Lord. Save me. Have mercy upon me. Keep me close to you, Lord. Help, help me to make frequent visits with you in prayer, in going to church, our 40 hours we just finished. But make visits in the church. Get to Mass every Sunday. Hear, get to your confession heard frequently as necessary. Get with the program. <laughs> Help me, Lord, to do that and be serious about it because otherwise I just goof off and I say, what's on YouTube instead of, hey, Lord, what do you want? What do you want? Well, there's a good long homily for you, but it's a lot, a lot to cover. And it's, um, we tend to prolong the process by our stubbornness. God would love to just do the shortcut and say, you're with me? Come on, let's do, let's get to work. But there's an awful lot of salesmanship that has to go on. I mean, in the good sense of the word, where God has to finally say, listen to me, and grab us by the lapels and say, listen to me. All right. So listen to him. Listen to him. May your Lent, as it unfolds, continue to be a good one. May you realize the love of God, but also be sober with how obtuse and stupid and foolish we can be. And let God continue to get through to you and say yes to him. Little hint. When he knocks, answer. Say yes. Say yes. Completely yes. <laughs>